Okay, so what we do at Atomwise, and this actually encompasses all of my uh, personal research as well, which means that uh, unlike our two colleagues, I can't present you with tons of stuff that directly talks about the data that I'm getting out of what I do, but I can you know, sort of provide signs around it to get you an idea. Um, but basically what we do, uh, I, I was surprised to look at the demographics that we have as many biologists uh, as, as showed up here. Um, what we do is we try to detect the affinity of um, standard drug candidate molecules for uh, specific receptor domains, right? So the biologically active receptor domains on uh, medicinally important proteins. Okay, and the idea is to do this essentially sight unseen, right? So um, we rely on publicly published data um, from X-ray crystallography uh, experiments. Uh, basically, if you don't know what this is, uh, you crystallize a protein, okay? You refine a protein from cells. So you destroy them and get the protein out, usually through uh, centrifugation. And then you, uh, you know, clean it up uh, and uh, attempt to get it into a crystal. Okay, so you have sort of a regularly stacked arrangement. Shoot x-rays at it, capture a diffractogram, so the reflection angles coming off the x-rays, and then a bunch of math takes place. And out of that, you get uh, sort of an electron density of the location of the atoms inside the protein. Okay. So we take these, these are actually just, uh, you know, mathematical structures, and we uh, do some trickery called docking to estimate where the most likely position of a candidate drug that hasn't been, um, uh, you know, crystallized with this protein, where it ought to be inside of its biologically relevant binding pocket. And then we train a neural network to give us a biological activity based on that. That's a it's a very complex, difficult problem. What do you mean by activity? Do you mean the bacteria don't recover? We we uh, get IC fifty usually or PKA scores um, from some type of assay. So IC fifty is the inhibition concentration for like you know whatever type of cell you have. Uh, that fifty percent of them die off within a period of time. These are relative, and so you have to have scientists manually transform the data. But basically, the idea is that we try to determine biological activity. You can also get PKA so, or PKI. So these are uh, scores that come from like uh, kinetics assay, like to see you know at what point the activity of the protein uh, stops going down. So you have like some a situation. Yes. In vivo, like how many dots? Yes, and the data is split and very large. Um, we don't mix them together yet, but I will someday, <clears throat> soon. <laughs> Sunday soon. Uh, uh, so the, the idea is here, uh, just learning about what I do. We, we have this proprietary structural data. Some of it is public, but we make it proprietary by doing a bunch of action to it. Uh, source experimental data, which we capture through you know, working with labs or just off public domain. Build the training base. Uh, we do, do its docking, which is just fitting the molecule. Um, there are quite a bit of details in here with like how we line up given examples of protein molecule docking structures, and then we put it through a convolutional neural net, which is basically what I'm going to be talking about today, actually. That's the topic of today's conversation, which is let's be philosophical about neural nets. That's actually what I'm going to talk to you about. Um, if you want to talk more later about the fancy stuff that I had planned, I was going to give you a hint about what I'm working on, and that is called tensor field networks. Um, but I'm not going to do that now because that just would be too much math and it would take a long time to talk about. So I'm going to start up here at the top and we'll go to the slideshow uh, from beginning. And now you can see my black box. Um, <clears throat> right. So we want to go inside the black box, right? We don't, we don't want to live in a world where people, um, so, so my colleagues here, uh, everybody's into this dynamical systems, Lyapunov uh, stuff, um, and I'm surprised at how many people really grabbed onto that. Um, generally, for the rest of us, when we use uh, equations to make models of systems, um, they're usually in the form of machine learning models, right? That's what's in your phone, that's what's, you know, at Stitch Fix, that's, you know, 
managing your camera. Um, so that's, that's what I'm into. Um, and I wanted to talk about the premier uh, machine learning model of our time, which is the artificial neural network. Um, I, I have opinions about whether or not that should be named that and uh, talk about the way that the complexity community has been tackling some of the behaviors of this system. <clears throat> so other stuff later. Okay, so uh, to answer uh, uh, Professor Fisher's uh, question, what is complexity? Well, I, like to, I think of the idea of complexity as dynamical systems. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to think of it as, I, I, I often think of it as a, uh, an emergent behavior that occurs as a result of uh, small autonomous units, right? And so you can go and you, you can get into like the cellular automata, like the game of life. Have people played that before? Played? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, by hand, right, yeah. You get, you get like little wooden blocks. Um, ideally, uh, when you actually build these things, uh, they have this sort of unpredicted uh, emergent behavior, which uh, is sometimes adaptive, you know, star and useful star, right? And that's kind of how we, uh, we think of the neural network today. Um, and uh, scientifically, I think of complexity as not only building this sort of reduced representation of a system, so you get these cellular automata, but using observations to refine it. So Dr. Fisher talked a lot about that. Um, and uh, that's kind of what I was going for today. So uh, machine learning, a love story, right? Um, <clears throat> The idea today is how did we go about getting machine learning from the complexity point of view? And Tom Mitchell famously described a computer being said to learn with a given experience uh, with respect to some class and some performance measure if the performance in that measure increases uh, with more experience, right? And name whatever experience it is, there are many ways to do it. Um, and uh, this started off sometime in the 50s with this idea. Um, if we want to make an artificial brain, can we make it out of artificial neurons, right? So McCullough Pitts sometime in 43, I mean, this is like World War II, right? It's like literally during the war they're doing this research. Um, <laughs> teach it to beat Nazis. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so they come up with this model of uh, the neuron. I think McCullough was a, a biologist and Pitts was a logician. Um, and uh, I'm showing it with three inputs and one output <clears throat> here. And the McCullough-Pitts neuron is very simple. Okay, basically it just takes a sum of its inputs and has some kind of function where uh, basically, if the sum of the inputs uh, is greater than zero, then it reproduces one from its function. Otherwise, it reproduces zero. So it's basically a yes-no system, right? Uh, I leave it to the reader to determine if that is an actual, you know, an accurate representation of this neuron. Um, where is X? Where's Y? I'm not sure, uh, you know, but we'll continue. <clears throat> that's a fantastic paper, by the way. Uh, that Pekatovich paper, that's great. You should read that. Did one of the paper was explicitly call out what's Y and X? Um, no, they don't call it the Y and X. They actually, this is actually an example of complexity being evolved to learn complexity. So they used a robotic evolution strategy to develop a probe to sample uh, electrical currents on the surface of the neuron. So they, they actually use this like complex, like, like a control systems approach to develop a, 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 a molecular probe that lights up when the neuron uh, sends out a signal. We're trying to get accurate representation yeah. of cell as a guaranteed way not to make progress. Right, yes. <laughs> Does it retain the like hybrid nature of sort of continuous signals resulting in 
discrete events. So like that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. So, so the big thing is that you have like, I mean, it's, it's very long. The probe sends out like one photon at a time and you use a photon counter and it's really beautiful. You can see the transduction of signals. Let's not get too much into that, but the Bukatovich paper is great. That's why I have the reference there. Um, so this simple, this McCullough Pitts neuron is great. It provides some powerful utility, which I think is a good example of, you know, building these small automata and having them do uh, good stuff. Like we can basically get the or and and not functions out of them just by setting, you know, what the threshold is for G, right? So if all of these are greater than one uh, or one of them is greater than one, then you can get or, right? So this one, this one, or this one have a value of one or more than, or it's greater than one, right? Or zero, more than zero, basically. Uh, they add to one and uh, then you have an or function, right? This or this. If all of them sum up uh, to three or greater, then you have an and. And then here you can have like a switching function where if you have any value in x1, then it sends out a zero. Um, and we can build these representations into tables, right? That's great. Um, we can even, you know, simulate a whole computer with the McCullough Pitts neuron, but logical circuits are not really adaptive, right? I mean, that kind of is just using a computer to simulate a computer. So uh, getting on to the, the uh, newer forms of neurons, we have the perceptron, um, which actually was like a missile targeting tool uh, for a while. Um, you can build layers of these guys and they're pretty good at picking out positive and negative labels, okay? And they basically work by, um, you, you build like, you know, a layer of them, you have some input here, and if the sum of the input is greater than a threshold value, then it sends out a one, if not zero. But the real innovation here is that these are trainable, right? So if you have a, uh, an X which falls in the positive label set, and for some reason it's not being classified correctly, you add uh, x to the weight for that particular type of x, right? That particular variable. And if it's in the negative, you subtract x from the weight, right? And so that's sort of like a first uh, example of like an adaptive automaton for this purpose. And these are great except they're kind of limited to linear functions. Um, it, it just like, you know, if you have to have if you have XOR, so for example, this, this per function only produces a positive value if these, these two values are different, right? Uh, you have to have one plane crossing this way and one plane crossing that way. Um, the perceptron can't do that. But there is something that can, and that's the modern artificial neuron. It can't do it individually, but in groups, you can do it, okay? Um, and the big difference here is that we don't fix the output to one. Uh, we actually set the output to be sort of a simulacrum of what a real neuron does, um, which is it has sort of a gradated signal, right? There is a, a fully on and fully off, but there's also some level in between, right? And we use this function <coughs> called the activation function. And uh, you make you make groups of these guys and you can get something like regression. So this is a fun thing. I actually have code for it. Um, so say that, uh, you know, the long debate over sleep versus study is improving your grades, right? The truth is that sleep improves your grade a lot better than study. Um, Especially and, during the lecture. Yeah, during the lecture. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> good, good night of sleep the night before will probably do a lot for your grade. Uh, I mean, assuming that you've done anything for the class. But anyway, you know, you have some, <laughs> you have you have some values, uh, and, and we want to determine uh, how this all works, right? So you put in, you, you have what's called an input layer of perceptrons, and this is sort of like a virtual layer, and the value of sleep goes into each one of your perceptrons here. This is, say, your hidden layer, and uh, the weights are adjusted until we find an accurate output for the amount of grade that you're going to get for a given input of sleep and, and study. And this is the basic principle of all deep learning that controls your phone and your car, right? 
the big question is, uh, is how do we actually improve these weights? Because we don't just subtract x, right? Um, we actually have to subtract the amount that the weight changes as a function of the error that the whole thing produces, right? And that process is called backpropagation, which I have many long slides on. We're not going to go over them. I just don't have the time, and neither do you. We're all too hungry and tired. Um, but if you want to talk about it more later, we can. Basically, backpropagation uses reverse differentiation to cut down the number of computations that you have to have. If you actually spend some time looking at it, it's not that complicated. But anyway, this is a pretty simple system comparatively, right? I mean, so... Uh, the titan of the modern era is the convolutional network, which is the thing I've been saying over and over again. And the big difference between the convolutional net, sorry for not putting up a reference, I'll make it up to them later. Uh, but basically the idea is that instead of having flat layers of neurons, we actually have uh, like 2D and even 3D uh, layers of neurons, right? So these, these guys consume data in the form of, say, an image, like you would with a protein, say. And uh, they refine them through successive layers of what's called bottlenecking, basically changing the number of weights that each responsible, each neuron in the layer down is uh, responsible for. Right? So basically, by shrinking layers, uh, you enable it to learn a, uh, a refined representation of the data as it comes in. Okay, and uh, why is it convolutional? It's not convolutional in the traditional sense that we all learned when we were infants where you take an integral over two functions. Uh, it's, it's, it's convolutional um, in the sense that you learn these sort of filter representations. Okay, this is a parameter uh, in the neural net. And the filter is uh, sort of scanned over the input image. This is the input image. This is the filter. And uh, you basically take the Hadamard product um, you probably learned that in elementary school. And um, the Hadamard product is just the point-to-point the -point product, and you sum it up, and that gets you this sort of reduced representation of the field above it. So modern nets actually learn the filter, and the, the, the filters actually are what represents the layers. So is this closer to sort of the discrete signal processing version of, of convolution, but applied over sort of tensor or like higher up? Like like it sounds, it sounds like what you're describing. And I'm trying to make the link. It, it actually, it, it's actually sort of like the, the the chaotic process inside of a human brain, right? You get you, you have an optical nerve that consumes something, and then it, um, it 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 goes through. I mean, if you can map the inputs, it goes through different representations as the 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 input passes all the way back to your, uh, you know, the back of your what is that medulla or whatever? Uh, yeah, that. So your occipital lobe, right? Your occipital lobe processes it and then refines what you're seeing. I have an, an image of that somewhere. But basically the idea is that you, you um, your brain, and I'm not even sure that this is how it was developed, but your brain learns refined representations in very much the same way that the, the convolutional neural net does. So this is the model so of the brain? Yes. Kind of. It's more like a model of a model, right? And so, like, I don't want to over, I don't want to go down that road quite yet, right? I think that that's more of the issue here. Would it be fair to conceptualize that as like a multi-layer volumetric version of a self-organizing map? Except the self-organizing map allows it to have. I think self-organizing maps allow free association between units, right? Because that's the like next step be between that and a neural gas. All right, so we're talking about much older models, OK? Um, this is like a pre-organized, self-organizing map, all right? Um, you're, you're, giving it, you're giving it limits within which each SOM can possibly develop a representation yeah. further way down, right? So for those of you that are a little left behind, just imagine that at the end we have to make a prediction, right? And so as it compares between the output of the net and its prediction, um, the weights are changing at each level. Okay, and that's, I'm kind of going to get to that in a minute. So uh, this, just this very simple process has led, and I could spend 25 minutes on this slide, I won't, but this very simple process has led to uh, tremendously frightening uh, outcomes. So this is the state of uh, 
of, of neural nets today. This thing is much smaller than I thought it would be, but basically this, is, this paper is absolutely stunning. Um, this, is, this data set that they're training it on is called the Clever data set, and basically it asks the machine a question in English, and the machine is asked to select out and learn however, uh, you know, whatever question is. So here you guys in the back can't possibly see this. They're asking the machine, what size is the cylinder that is left of the brown metal thing that is left of the big sphere? Okay, and it nailed this. So this particular one solves this set at 95.5% success rate. Like it can pick it out and he can, this, this particular machine can even make measurements on these, right? Um, this one here, the, Google's so into this. I don't know why they're so into this. This is called a generative <laughs> network. They, they really, they're just, they, they spend a lot of time on it. And they ask it to produce, th this one is really impressive. They ask it to produce a description. So you write a description of a bird. Um, an all black bird with a distinct thick rounded bill. And then the machine actually generates pictures of birds, generated pictures of birds that are photorealistic to the human eye that fits that description, okay? It generates a much um, less variable um, set of them than a person would. <laughs> yes, yeah, right, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think you're hitting, exactly, um, yes. Uh, and that's kind of where I wanted to go. Um, so let's keep that. Yeah, one more minute. Keep that. In, oh, please, come on, man. <laughs> get, can I borrow like three minutes or four? <laughs> All right. Just let me get, let me get through the jam here. So, so this, this raises the larger question. Um, if convolutional neural nets are the answer, what is the problem? Because this paper, uh, this is a recent uh, complexity crew paper, and they go inside and they're actually measuring the gradients, right, the changes in weights as the, the network is learning. And as you make the network more deep and more powerful, so the more like Colossus this network is, the more like white noise the gradients start to look like. So the gradients themselves, right, the changes in weights are looking like white noise. So that makes us wonder what exactly is the network learning, right? Um, this, this crew here, fantastic paper. Um, these guys are using a mutual information approach to study the behavior of the gradients inside the network. And so uh, we're low on time, but basically the idea is that they have, they, they basically use this mutual information mapping to measure how well the next layer down does at representing the layer before and also against the first input using mutual information. And uh, we get these relatively complex trajectories. So as, the, as we go from cool to warm, that's the number of training cycles that the, the neural network has gone through. And actually what we see here is that the network first, uh, so this is the trajectory in learning the original representation, and then this is the trajectory in learning uh, the next layer down. And actually what we, and as you go up, that's the layer number. Actually, what you see here is that uh, the network first learns a lot about what you're putting in and then starts to forget mm -hmm. as it curves back. And as it reaches this final optimum, this is in some place that's not much like the way a human thinks, right? Or at least the way you think you think, which is sort of getting to uh, Dr. Fisher's point, which is that has this story really been a success, right? I mean, have we actually modeled a human neuron? Um, could the pathway to this level of success have been shortened? Um, and as a bigger picture, what can we do to refine this reduced representation? You know, how meaningful is this really? Um, and, 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 and to my friend here in the front, um, is, is a mind really the same thing as reasoning, right? Did we actually build a brain with this stuff, even though it appears to be reasoning? Or is this actually poking at some underlying structure which is described apparently by white noise? Um, so this, that's sort of my, my stump speech there. So um, I leave it to you to decide if we have modeled neurons. Um, I think that the questions are big and still out there. <laughs>